Good morning and hello. Thank you for joining us for this talk as part of the show Invocation Democracy, a political and mystical virtual exhibition being presented by Pro Arts in Oakland. If you haven't yet seen the show, I encourage you to visit the ProArtsCommons.org website. The show is up through Inauguration Day. It has a long run through January 20th, 2021, with an intention to hold vigil for a peaceful transition of power and the democracy that we envision. So it's working its magic as we speak with 27 artists across the nation responding to this challenging time for our country and our democracy. It's presented in a 3D virtual gallery format, which is accessible to people all over the world. So that's a really great part. Today, we are lucky to have four of the exhibiting artists from the show with us, which I'm very excited about. We have Edgar Heap of Birds in Oklahoma, Penny Slinger in Los Angeles, John DeLiva Halpern in New York City, and Jennifer Locke in San Francisco. At the end of this talk, I will open it up for questions from the audience. I'll remind you again, but you will press the raise your hand button and I will turn on your mic and you can speak your question. We won't be using chat and we'll see how many questions we can get in at the end. I am Monet Clark. I will be moderating this talk. I am the curator for Invocation Democracy and I'm also an artist with a piece in the show myself. All right. We're ready for uh, Edgar's first image. Okay, so Edgar Heap of Birds. Um, I'm thrilled to have Edgar in this exhibition, as he knows, because I've emailed that to him a few times. Um, Edgar is a multidisciplinary artist and a member of the Cayenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma and considers himself an interventionist of history and often uses language as uh, one of his primary mediums. His works frequently take the form of public art messages and sculptural installations. He has taught at Yale University, Rhode Island School of Design, the University of Oklahoma, where he's retired after 30 years, is now a press professor emeritus. He's been awarded no less than three honorary doctorates, and his works are collected by a long list of major museums, including MoMA, the Whitney, the Walker Art Center, the Smithsonian, the Metropolitan, the British Museum in London, the Library of Congress, and many, many more. So Edgar has had quite an impact. His works consistently uh, have allowed us to see an American past that hasn't been entirely visible within the dominant culture, raising Native American visibility by bringing the truth regarding uh, their past and their present and their right to sovereignty uh, into the forefront of contemporary cultural thought. So it's quite an accomplishment. Um, next, we have Penny Slinger, uh, who is originally from London and currently lives and creates in Los Angeles. In the late 60s and early 70s, she was a seminal figure a uh, feminist figure in, in the London art world where she began having solo exhibitions using herself as muse, adapting the tools of surrealism and creating femme-centric explorations in both two-dimensional and three-dimensional forms of collage. She incorporated her surrealist collages and poetry work into book formats. And in 1977, she published the first of these and then the secret Dakini Oracle divination cards. And then in 79, she published a written manuscript, um, Sexual Secrets of Alchemy, The Alchemy of Ecstasy, Bringing Tantra to the Modern World. And this is a book that was on the coffee tables of all of my mother's friends growing up. So it was a, um, a very popular and widely distributed book. Um, she moved to the Caribbean and created a series of artworks, mostly paintings about the indigenous original inhabitants of the islands and released a video of that work, Visions of the Arawaks. Since 2009, she showed at the Manchester Art Museum and the Tate Modern, where she is in the collection, released a major work online, the 64 Dakini Oracle, which we have a work from in the show, Nutura. Uh, she became the subject of a documentary about her life and work in 2014 and has been working with the Dior Hot Couture Fashion House in immersive installations, which is pretty exciting, and making her 2020 pandemic series entitled 
my body in a box, which we have also an example of in the show called Heavy Lifting 2. Can you switch to her um, documentary picture? You don't have her documentary picture. There it is. Out of the shadows. All right. Um, John DeLiva Halpern, who uh, uh, is a performance artist and a filmmaker, and what he likes to call a cultural activist. Um, I think it's interesting to know that John grew up in a creative and intellectually stimulating Italian-American household on Long Island where he learned photography and filming from his grandfather, jazz improvisation from his beatnik uncle, and through his mother and his uncle's friends, Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, John was introduced to Buddhism at an early age and his love of Buddhism grew and grew more and more during college. In 1977, he earned his BFA and at the same time was introduced to the German artist, Joseph Beuys, who he's pictured with here, uh, who became a friend and mentor. And John began filming Joseph Boy's Transformer, billed as a collaboration. And he also uh, executed a piece called Bridging, a conceptual art event involving seven collaborators climbing up all of the seven suspension bridges in Manhattan during rush hour with the goal of uh, keeping terrorism off the front pages for one day, which made big news. And John can tell us more about that. Um, John immersed himself in a contemplative uh, uh, lifestyle um, in retreat in Italy um, with a BKS Iyengar protege. And uh, when he came out of that and finished Transformer, uh, its success in the art world prepared his next interactive public art events in Europe and U.S., where he engaged with over 100,000 participants um, in a work called Smoke Sculpture and another piece, Breath Sculpture, in Holland, where he lived in a hermetically sealed glass house for 10 days with 10,000 plants, doing a yogic practice of breathing once per minute. And he did a project called Fresh Air, where he brought mobile interactive breathing stations filled with plants to the streets addressing the ecologic environmental crisis um, way ahead of his time. And there he is with his mobile unit. Um, in 1992, John exhibited these works at the Tate Modern under the rubric Art for the 21st Century. John is also the owner of MDS Films and currently producing Waking Buddha about the meditation movement and Buddhism's consciously engaged culture for a sustainable future he is interested in catalyzing personal and collective humanitarian ecologic advocacy through his films, which include Transformer, which we already mentioned, Refuge, and Talking with the Dalai Lama, and also through his organization, the Cultural, the Institute for Cultural Activism International. So that's a little bit about John. Um, John uh, referred to himself as an eco-feminist when we first met, because I, I call myself one, and I, I thought that was marvelous to have an eco-feminist uh, in the 70s who was a man. Um, Jennifer Locke. Jennifer is a performance video and installation artist. She makes performance-based still imagery, and um, she can be referred to as a minimalist. We've joked about this. I say the later because the imagery that comes out of her work has a pristine minimalist aesthetic to it. Um, but her performances involve uh, physically intense sculptural actions which respond to cameras, the audience, and specific architecture. Within this framework, she plays with viewing structures, redistributing hierarchies between artist, model, camera, and audience in order to explore inner subjectivity, spectatorship, and the construction of Meaning, her actions focus on cycles of duration, physicality, and visibility, and draw from her experience as a dominatrix wrestler and artist model. Um, Jennifer has often created a separation between the audience, the action in the audience through the use of material barriers in her works. Live video feeds multiple camera perspectives, wireless microphones, and mini cameras and these audiovisual reiterations produce a ripple effect, flattening, repeating, echoing, amplifying, and displacing the actions by turning it as well as the audience performing its own spectatorship into a representation of itself. Locke has exhibited in venues such as the 2010 California Biennial, 
the 48th Venice Biennial, the Air de Paris in Paris, the 9th Havana Biennial, the Basel Art Fair, La Panderia, Mexico City, Palace de Vue Arts, Brussels, Canada, and New York, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, San Francisco, and many other museums and galleries in the States. She's received the 2006 Chauncey McKeever Award, a 2010 Goldie, and a 2012 Fleischhacker Foundation Eureka Fellowship, and she lives and works in San Francisco. All right. So amazing group. And um, I'm going to start with you, um, Edgar. Um, there's a, are we out of share mode? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I want to start with this image of, um, let me just bring it up, that I found on the internet when I was searching for some um, some works to show. And I know you have some you want to talk about too. Can you all see that? Um, I, I, I'm really interested in um, the, the issue of Standing Rock and what you say there as... Um, how do you say it? Standing Rock Awakens the World. Um, can you speak just a little? I mean, I could say a lot about it, but let's hear from you how you feel about um, this, uh, that moment in time where the tribes from all over the Americas were gathering and the statement that was being made, um, a cultural statement, in my view, that... Um, is needed um, more than ever. And it, it's like finally the voice of the indigenous um, is getting a, 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 the platform it deserves because we're in crisis. Um, but can you speak a bit about that that piece? Now this work uh, is actually 48 monoprint. So you're, I'm standing in front of the ghost uh, images. So there's a second pull from the plate and there's a, there's a, a brighter red. <laughs> Uh, series as well, 20 more on each, each uh, set of, of ghosts and primary prints. Um, and then the the, uh, the ghost has been something I've, I'm pursuing on every one of my print installations in that America sees natives as just very faintly. They don't see them very clearly and very broad. Mm -hmm. So I make, I make kind of a, a simpler, more subdued uh, image along with the big installation. And so this, this particular piece was done uh, looking through all the research from Standing Rock and it being really the place where tribes came together uh, since Wounded Knee, in a sense, since uh, the takeover and Wounded Knee. And my tribe, the Shine Arapaho, actually sent water and also we have a buffalo herd. So we sent buffalo meat up to uh, the camp. And so it was, it was a kind of a, a, a time to pitch in and help that kind of rebuttal to America. A uh, very important time uh, to bring the tribes together, and also, as, as you mentioned, to have the platform be given to the native people or to remark about the environment and politics and so on. So each one of these prints is a is kind of a small kind of uh, dist distillation of of issues that happen of violence and abuse and the land and of the people. Uh, and I did a lot of research to create the work. Yeah, it's a. It's just a wonderful piece. And, um, you know, I want you to know as a, I mean, I'm a mixed ancestry person, but basically moved through the world as a white person. Um, and all of the people I know, this um, gathering at Standing Rock was an enormous amount to all of us too. Um, it felt like um, the voice of the native people was reaching um, a level of visibility that I think hadn't quite happened before and at a time where it was showing that we, we need that perspective. Um, we honor that perspective. And there's actually two other works in the show. Um, and I, I would really hope that you all will look at Marie Sue's piece in the second gallery. She's a folk singer of indigenous descent and Eastern European descent. And it's a song about um, the Black Snake Prophecy and Standing Rock. And it's uh, an, a deeply mystical, beautiful work. If you look at the information section um, and read about that, I think you'll be um, healed by it. it it's, 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 it's healing. It's meant to be healing. And then we have Merritt Johnson, 
who's also um, a woman of uh, mixed ancestry, Native American, uh, Blackfoot, and uh, another tribe, Jamaican, and uh, Swedish, I think. And she also has a piece in the show um, talking about the black, the black snake prophecy, um, which uh, has come to be known as uh, oil lines and um, uh, this time we're in where we're fighting for, our, for climate justice um, as well as Native American sovereignty. Um, and so, oh, go ahead. The other three slides I gave you there. Yeah, are you ready for them? Oh, oh, oh. He'll bring them up. Okay, there are, there are two of these uh, smaller installations. They're half sheet pieces, uh, dead Indian stories and genocide and democracy. So for the last 10 years, I've been creating monoprints that deal with uh, American history. And I also kind of unpack certain political songs and then and the uh, Star Spangled Banner and America the Beautiful and so on. And just show the kind of hypocrisy that exists mm -hmm. between lyrics and then how Native people exist in real in reality. So each one of these pieces is about that kind of experience, uh, the history and then the reality of, uh, of a, a death and de democracy and, and uh, genocide and democracy. Can we have the next slide, please. Uh, so this piece deals with uh, uh, dead Indian stories. And so it deals with the massacre at Sand Creek, also the Washita massacre. And uh, again, a lot of research that goes into the, the creation of the work. And I work with like six words or, or seven words in my limitation of how I create the work. And uh, some of it does deal again with songs, political songs or the uh, uh, issues at school when you gave your you know oratory in the morning when you first start school days. Um, and some of these things are also about health as well. Uh, the lower right, the lower left uh, sure alone can damage the liver and that's about alcoholism and and how there's a lack of mentorship from there were prisoners of war taken away from the tribes uh china rapa and put in border prisons so that was also a tough time for the nation and there was not much mentorship so that that led to a lot of as well you hear me okay is that right yeah okay sounds good edgar and then that next slide please uh, this is the most recent piece. I wanted to make sure and give you an idea of what I'm working on now. And those are half the size of the sheet. So a full sheet is 22 by 30 inches. And so those previous ones were 15 by 20, 22. Uh, this piece is called Mark Fisher on the Medicine. And it kind of comes out later on the Penny Rock piece uh, about water being water. Uh, and so I looked at all the um, about how precious water is, uh, even within when you're being uh, gestated by your mother, all the fluids we deal with. On the left side are 20 monoprints that are the primary. First pull on the plate, and then the second pull is on the right. So those are the ghost prints. And I create all these all these monoprints in Fourth Dimension Studio, uh, and I've work, been working there for about 20 years. Uh, the last two years, I've been working on these large installations. This installation is at feet by 30 feet. Uh, and MoMA collected uh, about Custer and, and the, the Washtenaw Massacre. Uh, we have uh, another series called Places of Healing, one called Columbus Day, uh, The House of the People's The Highest Law. And you saw Standing Rock Awakens the World. A newer one also is called Why is Immigration Dedicate, Dictated by Foreigners? And you're looking at water is your only medicine. I will be in Santa Fe uh, in about two weeks to create a new series of works uh, called Our Red Nations Were Always Green, which will have a view of ecology from a native perspective. And so I've been focusing a lot of my time on these monoprints and having this large scale effect in a museum or gallery space, but to particularly work on the ghost being pre presented in that America we don't see the left side as clearly. We, we, the left side on the, of the print is the bolder uh, first take on the printmaking. What we see is the faint, kind of hard to read, misunderstood side on the right. And so all of my prints have a ghost, have a primary, but I put them together. So I'm hoping to eliminate that kind of uh, understanding by showing both primary and 
goats together. Water is your only milk. I love how you're using uh, the goat uh, analogy. Um, I've often uh, heard Native Americans speak uh, about feeling like ghosts in their own native yeah. lands. So I think it's very effective to do this on a visual level. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Edgar. And we'll, we'll come back to you. Um, your work is, is, uh, it's just powerful. And I, I'm, I'm really happy that it's, um, it's proliferated as much as it has. And I think that you've spurred a, uh, a movement. I, I know that when I first um, became aware of your work, I think it was in the late 80s, um, it was very rare to have a Native American perspective in the discourse. And uh, now it's fairly common. There's a lot of Native American artists who found their way into contemporary art as a means to express these issues of invisibility and visibility and, and, and everything else. And don't you think that's true? There's just, there's a, really a, a, a kind of wealth of um, Native American artists working in contemporary art specifically. Yeah, I think so. And I think also it's just a matter of being uh, more proactive. And I, uh, behind me is a cover of Art in America I worked on with a monoprint. This is Do Not Dance for Pay. And so that was me calling out all the Native artists in the, in the country and saying, you know, we kind of stop dancing for pay. We have to be more critical, more political. Yeah. Kind of more aggressive. See and yourself think, differently. In the past, we haven't done that. And, and so no one has really learned about the reality. So I do feel there's some young artists coming along that are more, more aggressive and they don't dance for pay. It feels to me like there is a shift going on. I know in my local town, um, there's a tribe here that has been trying to get recognition and they've just you know, they were, uh, it was at, they were at risk to even identify as Native American and that, and there's just slowly gained this public awareness and momentum and surrounding and holding them. And it, it, I feel this, it, I, there's, you know, don't get me wrong, there's a long way to go, but I feel a shift happening. Um, and um, climate change and the environmental issue, I think is part of it. Um, anyway, I, I really, I'm proud of the work you've done all these years. And I really think you've, you've been an inspiration to a lot of young Native American artists. And the reason that they're all so vocal and out there is because you started something. So um, I think it's amazing. Um, okay, so I wanna uh, move on to Penny Slinger. Um, Penny has been an activist in a, in a, in a different realm, but in, in not a dissimilar way. Um, I didn't mention the mystic when I was reading about you. I think that's a, a really important component to what you do. And there's a certain, um, in the art world also, uh, a tendency to be dismissive of uh, mystic subject matter and even femme-centric subject matter. And I also feel that there's a little bit of a shift going on right now. Um, I want to say that in 2012 or 2013, you said something to me that the feminine must rise if we're to get through any of these cultural, social, and ecological problems. Are we having problems? And at the time, I realized I had an enormous amount of inter internalized misogyny because when you said it, I was oh, like, oh, that's so nice. okay over here. like silly or something, you know, like I, I dismissed it. I dismissed it and it's the cornerstone of everything. And, but I, I kind of recognized I was doing that at the time. And then every since then um, in contact with you in the goddess temple, she used to have this property in the mountains um, of Santa Cruz that was dedicated to um, sacred feminine. Um, I really realized that, you know, everything I've been about all these years has been about the rise of the feminine. So I don't know why I reacted to your statement that way, except that, we, um, you know, we dismiss the feminine culturally and I'm a part of this culture. So I'd like to know if you think from that time, 2013, if um, there's been some shifts in terms of uh, biases towards the feminine principle and what that means to you. Well, I think that we are in shifting sands in general right now. And, of course, we're actually 
facing a whole, not only cultural, but, you know, world uh, survival crisis because of the way that we have diminished the feminine in our psyches. And I'm not talking about just women, I'm talking about um, men and women. Everybody needs to start awakening up to embracing that feminine side of themselves. And although, in a way, it's a little cliche to talk about masculine and feminine, we're all made up of all these components. It's just that that we give pride of place to. And I'm talking about the kind of things that we associate with the feminine side, that which is compassionate, that which is conservative in the sense of conserving, that which is intuitive, that which is connected. And, you know, the whole idea of a new paradigm of feminine wisdom coming in, it's not just to do with sexual nature of things, it's to do with that a real divine feminine wisdom. And that wisdom is that which the indigenous people know for sure of the honoring of the spirit in all things. Exactly. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the awakening of this spirituality which sees everything as sacred. You know, we can't see it as some disembodied God in the sky and then behave in ways which are a heartless, ruthless and greedy in so many different ways. We have to understand that circle and hoop of life that we need to give back as we take and to just awaken to all these things. Mm -hmm. And as I believe that what gets embodied comes from what consciousness brings in first, then to me it's really finding these things within, awakening to these, meditating on these principles of what really matters and that everything matters and all matter matters and that we need to start looking at things in a new way so that we can not only conserve the life of the planet but ourselves as human beings within this circle of life we are all connected we are all part and parcel of everything so this cycle of usury needs to stop and all this you know huge karmic stain of, of aeons of taking advantage rather than being in a give and take cooperative situation all of nature works on a symbiotic principle and we need to re-embrace that yeah well said well said and i think the interesting thing is that really overlaps with the traditional indigenous perspective which um, yeah. I, I always like to point out is not just brown skinned people in the Americas. Indigenous people have felt this way on all continents through all different times. And okay. um, and I, I think it's important that we of different ancestries um, connect with each other who understand these basic principles about the sacredness of all life right. um, and the interconnectivity of all life. Absolutely. And if we kind of broaden our perspective and just for instance, embrace the idea of reincarnation and think that perhaps we are bigger, ourselves are bigger than this, this flesh and blood that we find ourselves in now and understand a self that could have been in another skin. And I don't even mean just another human skin. I'm talking about in fur and feathers, in understanding the spirit that is sentient, in all sentient life, then we can start to release all the dogma and all the bigotry, which has caused so much damage and harm for all this time and start to reestablish new patterns of behavior which are not seeing others as separate, but as part of ourselves. And I think this is where uh, spiritual practice that is known in shamanism and in Buddhism, in Tantra, which I found and in, embraced, which is not the religion of sex. It is actually the whole weave of everything. I think this is the, the awakening that we all need to have now so that in this time of a, a pandemic sit out and look, that we can stand back and reassess and reset ourselves because how we've been acting isn't really working 
and it doesn't have longevity. You know, this idea of looking for seven generations, that kind of perspective of not just taking for what you need now, but at looking at the future and looking at the repercussions and the karma. Again, another thing, if we could just embrace that thought for a moment, that whatever we do comes back to us, then even just for selfish reasons of... I'm not going to act badly to someone else because that's going to come back on me in the end. If we could just start looking at these things in that kind of way, then we have a chance of resetting and just embracing not only all races of beings, but also all the creatures and all the elements themselves of this living planet that we're part of. Yeah, it's why I wanted to include animals in this show about democracy. (laughs) Because we can't have a healthy democracy if we don't take care of the beings that live within it, which include the animal and plant kingdom, as well as all the different people, um, Absolutely. the diversity. And there's, a, there's an interconnectedness um, in all of that. Um, I wanted to just mention, I like to reference the yin and yang Taoist philosophy to look at the masculine and feminine because it breaks it down um, really interestingly and and because it's these are attributes and qualities that exist in all genders it's it's just we tend to tether them to women and then we culturally dismiss and devalue and marginalize them but in the 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 Taoist philosophy the mystic and the non-linear and the intuitive methods for data collecting are the yin feminine so we just tend we're, we're just culturally imbalanced where we exalt the logical rational thought and they're both great but we we just don't put as much value on the feminine principle, the emotional, the subconscious mind, nurturing, yielding, softness, the energetic and invisible world, uh, the internal and stillness, which I think is really interesting. And all of these things together equal coolness. And then when you look at their counterparts, destruction, counterparts, destruction, force, hardness, the physical, visible world, the con- uh, conquering, the conscious mind, the external, and the fast pace, those are equal heat. So we have a, a planet that's imbalanced that's heating up because we're culturally imbalanced where we don't value the feminine principle essentially. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's an interesting way to explain it because it really isn't about gender. Um, right. We've all seen nurturing men. And we've all seen conquering women, <laughs> right? So, yes. it's, and uh, the out of balance thing that has um, put the feminine in detriment has been a loss for the men as well. You know, if they can't access and exhibit that feminine side of themselves, that soft, vulnerable, sensitive side of themselves, that intuitive nature, then they are only living as half beings too. So. Everything has been to the disadvantage. And so it's just a reset. And it's interesting to look that, as in the world of art, which is just one little facet of the whole cultural matrix, but, you know, a a very key one. We look at now the, the, the feminine coming into focus. And at the same time, we're looking at the idea that art can maybe embody the mystic and the spiritual as well, because that's for a long time being a big no-no from the world of fine art. And I've had to myself dumb down all my references to spirituality. I know because you I said that. And so, you know, I feel that there is a potential. You look at exhibitions of Hilma after King. I was talking about her the other day on uh, a Zoom call and the fact that people are recognizing that perhaps these things do have a place in the world of art and they shouldn't be separated and segregated. And so it's only in the hope of an integration and that integration, as you were so aptly saying, between the male and female sides and this divisiveness, which we've all had to face and put um, both the indigenous, the feminine, all these aspects being put in a victim role rather than being put in this role of equal honor and respect so that it's thrown everything out of balance. And we mm-hmm. just need to drag all that back and bring it into a focus of balance and loving respect for each other and for those parts of ourselves that have been atrophied. Mm-hmm. And, and so the heart I wanted to do is the big reckoner. 
Yeah, it is. And I, I, I wanted to do this show and just kind of push that door open and be like, I'm going to talk about caring and empathy and nurturing and the mystic and, and uh, almost as a protest, you know, uh, in the art world. But I also feel that the door had been cracked open a little bit. It started with Marjorie Cameroon. I don't know if you're familiar right. with her. Oh, indeed. Yes. She had a show about five years ago at MOCA. And I thought, ah, the tides are changing. And then there were a bunch of articles in LA about the mystic in the art. And then it kind of fizzled. But the, um, the Hilma AF Clint show was their largest uh, attended exhibition ever. And um, so it really got people thinking. And she had visualized and seen a spiral gallery before the Guggenheim was ever built. And then there it was finally manifested as she had, you know, and that goes back to prophecies and nonlinear methods of data collecting, which are completely valid if you do them in a certain proper way, of course. I mean, there's always charlatans, right? So um, <laughs> this leads me to John Halpern. And um, uh, I have a couple questions, but I want to read a quote that uh, Joseph Boyce said in your film, um, Boys, Boys Transformer. Is that the name of the film, John? Oh, you're unmuted. Sorry, sorry. Hang on. Ask mute. Ask to unmute. Okay, you're unmuted. That, that was just me pretending that I'm still muted. <laughs> I was like, oh no, it's not working. Okay. Um, I know. I'm just being tricky. Yeah, that's the film, jo Joseph Boy's Transformer. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting to note, and I noticed this once with um, uh, Ed Moses, who uh, passed away a couple years ago, but was a, uh, in his 90s and a central figure in Los Angeles in abstract art. And a total macho man, he dated Marilyn Monroe, and he was a real kind of sexist kind of guy, but you, you just loved him because he kind of said what he meant mm -hmm. and... He didn't take any bullshit um, and he was an amazing painter, but he called himself a shaman. And I was uh, like, OK, how come this guy can call himself a shaman? But if any woman calls himself a spiritual whatever, then they're dismissed. Right. It goes back to this thing. So Joseph Boys was definitely a shaman, um, if you, you know, an art shaman. And he said something in the movie. I was watching it again last night. He said, I'm not interested to eliminate the materialistic analytic mythology out of the discussion. I want only to en enlarge the discussion to other aspects of meaning. I believe that the human being is fundamentally a spiritual being and that our visual world must be extended to encompass all the invisible energies with which we have lost contact or, or from which we have become alienated. And, right. you know, he was just right on the money. And, um, and so ahead of his time and just, you know, he was always in this kind of alternate, altered state. And so John met him. You met him fresh out of college. How old were you when you met Joseph Boys? Um, Joseph invited me to Germany when I was 22. Fresh out of college, yeah. Yeah, and so you had this marvelous um, affinity and connection to each other. So you could kind of I, I, hated, I, I, I hated Joseph Boys's work until um, until <laughs> until the moment that he invited me to Germany because I I was forced <laughs> to understand his work on a deeper level than the level that I had only superficially understood. Um, we didn't understand Joseph Boys, I think, in America at the time, and many of us still don't. In fact, one of our friends, Chris Burden, who I think we all are aware of, uh, one time Chris said to me right. when I was in his studio in Venice, California, he said, oh, Joseph Boys is a Nazi. I don't want to know anything about him. And um, I don't want to know anything about him. Wow. Well, yeah, but that, that's the, I'm not um, not because it's Chris, but because it's a sentiment. And um, yeah. I had to overcome my own prejudice toward Germans uh, when I was going to Germany in 1977. But, um, but Joseph Boys um, calls himself a shaman because, you know, he survived a, a, 
a kind of death defying yeah. plane crash. And one of the yeah. one of the criteria for a, a shaman, whether it's a male or a female um, body, is that uh, the shaman is able to uh, bring themselves back from the dead, basically, um, to heal themselves from. Uh, <laughs> you understand? So, so in in a sense, um, maybe in a larger sense, we are all challenged with becoming a, a kind of a, a, a community of, of shamanism uh, at this time in, in society. Um, we have to save ourselves and the planet. So shamanism is very relevant in terms of the ecologic sensibilities. And uh, of course, the, it's, what's wonderful is that, you know, what's happening in the transgender uh, community and the LGBTQ community we are, of course, um, presented with new possibilities of seeing ourselves. And what one of the things that I pointed out about Joseph's work is that, like all uh, art that is transformative, it wakes us up, it shocks us, and it sustains that state of shock and vulnerability and rawness so that, in fact, uh, our own vulnerability becomes the threshold to feel the world, to be in contact with the universe, not in a conceptual way, not from an intellectual, rational way, uh, let's say, of, of, of um, karmic uh, um, conceptuality, but from an experiential way that because we're all connected, we can't hurt each other because we're hurting ourselves. It's not that we can't hurt each other because we don't want to be hurt by somebody else. That's sort of psychologically, um, you know, sort of absolutely powerful. But from the experiential perspective and from the shaman's perspective, you know, we are naked to our interconnectivity. And from that position, we're informed as well about what we can do next what steps to take next. And this is the time when we have to work together. And that's why Emily Harris and I, the artist, Emily Harris and I started the Institute for Cultural Activism International um, because we believe in the thirst for community and the power of community when community works together. Mm -hmm. So Joseph certainly uh, is still a very lively and valid um, symbol um, of someone who walked the walk. He was also a, a bit of a macho guy um, that was quite in style, unfortunately. But for a young man like me in the, in the 70s, um, I was really blessed to be feminized by um, our girlfriends, you know, our young women friends who were becoming liberated and experimenting. And that, that let us off the hook for mm -hmm. our roles and our, you know, um, chauvinistic attitudes, whether they were cultural chauvinist attitudes or sexuality attitudes, et cetera. So just to maybe contextualize this a little bit in terms of the pandemic, we've had this opportunity to abandon, in some cases choicelessly, how it is we see ourselves. Uh, the, the COVID's given us this re enormous opportunity to um, really consider what is most important in our lives. Uh, perhaps it's family, perhaps it's community, and the, our deeper values, because identity? What, what is that? If only a tool to transform the society. You know, we, we acquire all these fantastic uh, skills of having an ego and a personality and all these other kinds of assets of charm and etc. But if we identify with those things, we're stuck. We're in a dead end track that goes nowhere. But if we can use those tools and all those assets and the traumas of our personal history and our, our collective history, if we can use and recover from those traumas, then what we have is this enormous treasure trove 
of wisdom and resource and knowledge, you know, from our experiences. Mm -hmm. but the trick is to remove the identity, to remove the I, the, um, the, you know, the projection of an I and the prejudice, prejudice of, of, uh, of our belief systems. So, you know, art can really let us off the hook. And I think this exhibition is very powerful. Um, yeah. Every artist that I've really cared about, I think actually was a mystic. Um, you know, for, for example, Marcel Duchamp, there's a, a great book that Jackie Bass came out with. I don't know if you're aware of it, uh, Penny or Jennifer or Monet, but I, um, Jacqueline wrote this amazing book about the tantric training of Marcel Duchamp. Edgar, uh, maybe you're aware that Duchamp was a practicing uh, yogi, but in his work, yeah, his, his teacher was a, a Dakini, a woman in Vienna, um, who later became Sri Aurobindo's, uh, sort of the mother of the Sri Aurobindo Center in Aurobindo, Aroville, right, in India. Um, and she was called Ma. That was Duchamp's teacher. And all these artists, you know, the Surrealists, the Dadaists, all these people, uh, particularly congregated in Paris, actually participated in seances regularly. So uh, to outcast the mystic in art is to, <laughs> is to um, well, perhaps these mystics, these artist mystics have been secret mystics because mysticism is kind of a dangerous thing. Um, has been seen. It's just a taste, you know, it's a time period we've gone through that I think is coming to an end. But I, I, I tend to believe um, that all art practices are a form of transmutation. You may not want to call it mystic, but you're, it's like an alchemy. You're taking one energy and you're transforming it into something else, which leads me to our other panelist, Jennifer Locke, who, um, I just want to say, you know, Thank you for having organized this really exceptional exhibition. Oh, thank you for saying that. So timely and so perfectly appropriate in, in its medium and its venue. Um, and it's, it's really a, a huge thrill to be here with, with uh, Edgar, Jennifer, and Penny, and, and with Monet. Um, so for me. <laughs> we are coming together as the really we are all together and it's great to finally recognize that there is this community. It's, yeah. it's pervasive. So excuse me, Jennifer, for interrupting. <laughs> I just want you know, what a joy it is. Show his gratitude. And, you know, it is nice to um, come together on these subjects that have been kind of out of fashion and come forward and say, Hey, you know, this is actually how we feel about things. And I think as a native American person, you know, you always, you know, Edgar, I would imagine I grew up in the back to nature subculture. So I had to hide a lot of who I was all the time. Penny's saying you had to hide, you can tone down your mysticism. I mean, I think there's a common theme here and it's certainly not the same in terms of politically how Native Americans are treated, but I think culturally you have to tone down for the external world, what it is you actually, how you see the world and how you, how you view it. Um, so I think there's a, a thread there. Um, Jennifer's work um, is, you know, I wouldn't call it mystical or political. And she would, when, we, when I first asked her to be in the show, she's like, well, I'm not political. And I'm like, the personal is political. <laughs> Everything's political. And I really wanted to see what she would create um, just thrown kind of a curveball, like a different way of approaching things. And I think all art practices are a form of transmutation where you're, you're working something out on some, on, on, on some level. And, you know, that's a kind of healing perspective to look at. And it's not an intellectual one. And there's many interpretations. But I'm very, very curious. Why the tree? <laughs> How did you get to the tree? And I'm so excited about the tree. If you haven't seen Jennifer's piece yet, she's outside with this magnificent tree. And she usually works with architecture, which is man-made, right? Um, and it happened when she first came on the show, it was more focused about politics. And we switched the show and I made my own show. 
And then it, it for me, inc- it started incorporating all these things we're talking about because it's all interrelated to our democracy. But And then you just hit the nail on the head. You were just like right in the pocket of, you know, this environmental um, kind of subject matter and theme. But but why the tree? I want to know. I want to know everything. I know you don't like to talk about the ins and outs of your work, but I, as much as you'll give us. <laughs> oh, no, I'm a total windbag about my work, actually. No, it's more. Oh, uh, no, no. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I do usually, sh- I really like, my, I really like using kind of oppressive institutional space. And in a way, I think it's in juxtaposition with the body because I'm very interested in the body and I like that kind of tension between this kind of very messy um well the messiness of being in a body and I like that kind of um real like I said oppressive space um but I I've been starting to think about these this body of work I've been thinking about it for a long time and I haven't been able to figure out how to do it and I my initial inspiration was to shoot shoot these pieces outside and so I started shooting the pieces and I just could not fucking get a good shot outside. I'm used to working indoors with a very controlled situation and I would go out and the light would be wrong or the sun would change. And so it was really interesting to work. Um, I actually had to go out a million times just to get these four shots. So that was interesting because I'm, again, I'm used to working in these um, spaces that I can control. So um, (laughs) you can't control mother nature. So as far as the tree goes, um, you know, I initially, I did this little, I mean, I don't know if this is interesting, but I, I had been sitting in my yard and we have this gigantic, I guess it's a cedar tree and it, the wind was blowing and I, I just did this experimental shot and I was thinking about how, what I could shoot in nature a lot. I come up with a couple of different, um, like the candle, uh, passage and, um, the jumping, but I, I was trying to fill, fill, you know, think of some other things I could do. And so, um, anyway, uh, base, base, I'm not sure, quite sure to answer this, but I was just thinking of the idea of the figure um, kind of having this, uh, trying to um, synchronize timelines, you know, because trees have the sense of time and space, the lifespan of a tree and their um, time signature of the tree versus that of the human and especially the human now in this historical moment. So I guess I was trying to um, uh, have this experience of, of slowing down. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I failed, but to the timeline of the tree. And it's funny because you were slowing down I, to still, well, tree is stillness, right? The tree is yeah. still. Yeah, that's right. Which is, you know, difficult for humans. And, and again, with this technological age, I think it's difficult to um, even be in our bodies, let alone to imagine, you know, being in a tree's body grounded you know you think the roots go down as far as the branches and the height go up and then now the scientists have shown us that the trees roots are all in you know playing footsie with each other and they're all communicating which goes back then to what indigenous people have told us all along that they're sentient and now right sentience and i've been i've been reading about it it has not entered into my work in any way shape or form so this idea of um you know, this, um, this woven tapestry of life. And uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's just the times that it's leading us if you're open to feeling, you know, it's the time to kind of wake up to this, these thought forms, you know, and sure. I think with your work, you know, you, you, it feels to me like you feel your way through a lot of times. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of um, balancing kind of the brain with the intuition. It's funny because my work is is very controlled and kind of pared down in a lot of ways, but there's a great deal of intuition that comes into it, but it's all kind of um, under this kind of discipline of, of extreme formal regulation or rigorousness. Um, uh, so these pieces are, are, you know, when I, it's funny because talking about the mystic, um, <clears throat> I started doing these spell sp- pieces earlier this year and you know, when, when I was a little girl, I really wanted to be a witch when I grew up. Oh, and I didn't know that. I, cast some sp- I tried casting some spells and it failed. And so <laughs> some years ago, I, I started thinking about, oh, maybe I should explore witchcraft because it's kind of, it's kind of still, you know, it's always back here in the back of my mind. And so I started reading these books about it and I realized, oh, I'm already doing this in my work. Like I'm not, it's not, the content is different yeah. and all the signifiers are different, but I'm actually constructing this power 
power raising event. Like in my performances and in my videos, I'm very interested in, in conveying this kind of um, dynamic, uh, attempting with, with what's happening in the video to operate on the viewer's body and, and sense of um, maybe a little uncanniness or this sort of like space of uh, opening to this um, where things aren't entirely resolved. And so, you know, working with these, uh, you know, using a candle for me is it was a really huge decision for me to start utilizing this kind of content. And it's <laughs> so dangerous um, because, you know, it's it's got this um, overly, well, not overly, it's just, it's very, um, well, it could, it could dip into the realm of the cliche, you know, not, not to, you know, um, denigrate it. It's just that for me personally, it was... I, but I kind of like that challenge of using loaded subject matter and mm -hmm. trying to make it kind of transcend itself as, as best I can. Have. So um, I don't know if it was the pandemic. And also John was saying something about, um, I'm totally butchering what you said, but you know, I'm at this point in my life where I'm like in middle age. And so there's this thing happening around like death of ego that I think happens. Yeah. It happens in, in midlife mm -hmm. uh, where I'm having to uh, open to these, well, you know, it's like, it's like, you can fight all you want, but it, you're not going to stop it. And, and so there's this thing about trying to embrace these uh, other, these other elements that have maybe been pushed down or put aside that um, were actually, it's so weird because what's happening in the culture now, I mean, you know, there's these two things happening very extremely side by side, but this, um, we've been talking about this different kind of paradigm in terms of, you know, embracing the feminine for lack of a better term, but you know, the things we associate with femininity. And I think um, for me, uh, even though like in my work, I'm always, kind of, I'm always, I'm not interested in, in, in my personal identity in the work. It's always kind of, I'm trying to kind of um, tap, tamp that down. It's more about the figure. So the gender is, all, is generally pretty nonspecific. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, but, I, but for me, like that flow of that kind of other kind of information coming up in this, um, from this other place and um, allowing that to sort of um, just come up and, and take over and see what it does. It's been very interesting. I'm, I'm really happy because I, I really had given up on shooting outdoors. And for the show, I'm like, all right, I'm going to fucking make this thing happen. <laughs> so I, was glad I was able to. Make I it. was Thank thrilled. You. I was Brad, Brad can tell you my boyfriend who's helping over here in tech yeah. was, was his favorite piece. He just watched it over and over. He just, you know, something about it just Not a competition. Him, you know? <laughs> and I think what you're talking about is this subject that I wanted to point out in the in the talk is the liminality of artistic practice. And what is liminality? Relating to a transitional or initial stage of a process occupying a position at or on both sides of a boundary, boundary or threshold. Yeah. And I think that art, like you're saying, you wanted to do spells or be a witch. I mean, it basically, you basically are, you know, you're an art witch and you can intellectualize it and you can feel it and, and, and it doesn't have to look like what a witch looks like or what a witch dog right. or a shaman. Right. But it is a form of, of, it's in the same family as those things, what you do. 100%. And, and you're right. Like for me, like I realized when I was doing these pieces, because while I was shooting them, I realized like I'm not making it happen. The, the video is making it happen. It's, not, it's really not personal. It's not me. It's not. A, and there are also these spells that are not meant for, they're not intended to for a specific outcome. They're, they're an attempt to um, articulate some kind of dynamic or opening as opposed to to, you know, I'm going to do this thing and then this is going to happen or I'm going to focus really yeah, hard. Yeah, right. Uh, it was interesting. Well, that's where you get ego. You know, there's like spiritual practitioners who do things for the wrong reasons and motivation and intention is mm -hmm. so important. That's why I can't stand Crowley because it's like, what is there? It's all dark and nasty. People are so into him because he worked with the invisible world. Well, to what end? I don't, you know, well, I don't. power, right? Power is power. power. And power is ego. Right, right. and power so is like power. opening up you know, in these, pro I'm thrilled about these spell works. I'm, I'm so, you know, cause it, you know, Je Jennifer and I have known each other since probably 1988 or something like that, yeah. or earlier. Um, yeah. And so we've been able to kind of watch each other over the years, go yeah. through different processes. And this is an exciting kind of uh, departure, I think, interesting, you know, new, new, uh, 
era of your work. And I'm so happy that you got to debut one in the show. Thrilled. Yeah. And I have to tell you, I, I'm, uh, I looked at the show just to refresh my memory again. And I looked at everything again. It's a really beautiful show, Monet. And it's such a diverse mix oh, of um, uh, just different ways of talking about this, this sense of, um, I don't know, I, I can't quite put the word together, but it's, um, it's a very, it, uh, I like that it's all these different approaches. That's what I'm trying to say. All these different approaches, all these different kinds of people and all these um, kinds of ways of communicating um, a sensibility and, and something about um, the topic of the exhibit. So I really appreciate what you, what you've put together here. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, yeah, I wanted yeah. to uh, just include in the umbrella of democracy um, that the democracy is created from our intentions. It's in its, in a sense, a kind of spell um and um it's something we have to care for we have to nurture its roots in our country are uh, pretty deplorable as edgar pointed out in his contributions to the show and we have some reckoning to remedy um some of these um, injustices and imbalances i think to correct things we have climate change which is uh, an impending doom that if we don't correct, you know, it's pretty much there is no democracy, there is no people. And we have to recognize that all the plants and animals are part of this picture. We have to steward the land properly. We have to take care of everything. And then that goes back to the feminine. So I've always said for a long time that the way to change the political world is through a spiritual awakening. And, you know, we've all talked about that, John and Penny, but you know, you can't go out in the art world and go, we need to spiritually awake, you know, because then they're just like, oh God, I don't want to talk to you. So this was my attempt to kind of slip it in and put some different combinations together and see if we could get to this uh, discourse of the mystic as it relates to the physical world. Um, and um, yeah, every piece, every single piece in the show is a is a part of the overall message they all have a a, a place and um we're getting to one o'clock here i wanted to um john did you want to say something brad Singh, did you raise your hand or something no. uh, yeah thank you thanks brad and thanks monet and I, I wanted to say something a little funny but i feel like monet you are a kind of um eclectic activist or an, an activist uh, for eclecticism I just wanted to mention that in the most um, sort of respectful way. I can relate to a lot of different kind of things in people. That's for sure. <laughs> There's there are these threads that connect it all, and it's very wonderful to be here together with also 30, 31 people. Uh, you know, on this on the Zoom. Um, you know, welcome everybody to this yeah. very special meeting that we're having. Um, we but I was. I, 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 Edgar, the other day, um, our friend, Emily and I, Emily Harris and I had a friend uh, from the Upper Peninsula, uh, Mich Michigan, his, um, his chief Sundance barking dog, um, Daryl Brown. Um, and Daryl said that, you know, our bodies don't end with our skin. You know, the sun is part of our bodies. We don't own our breath, you know. And, and Daryl was very um, inspiring, describing everyone as a, a, a light being. Um, and that he said, we, there'll be many casualties in the process of saving the e ecology or, you know, sustainability. There'll be many ecologies and humankind may suffer a great deal, but it's not the only, the only uh, sort of area that we should be um, considering where we are connected to other realms and, and other beings, etc. cetera. Um, and I know from conversations with Daryl that he, he does believe in um, extraterrestrials, for example. And he described this amazing experience he had, Edgar, when he was at a ceremony in Florida uh, where there was an array of elders sitting outside the ceremony in a um, lotus position, sitting in a full lotus position, just like Indian yogins. 
and they were meditating. And what were they meditating about? He found out later. They were meditating about how to exist without breath and holding the space for the bigger ceremony that was going on. They were creating this kind of huge kind of tuning fork, um, you know, and a holding space for this uh, activity to occur. It, it quite blew him away. So one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I mentioned it to Daryl, but we didn't have time to talk about it, it, it seems that artists and other and other people, but artists who are kind of marginalized people in the, uh, you know, in the uh, commodity world are quite sensitized to the environment, are quite sensitized to the feminine and to intuition, um, as, as are uh, indigenous people. And I wonder if there's some, uh, you know, I, th I think that's true, and I, I feel I, I would say I think about it a lot, and uh, I talk about it sometimes in my in my uh, lectures. But uh, the thought of that, uh, you know, the the people always put themselves first, and we're even in this discussion where we are doing that, and the tribes are very have a lot of humility. They're very thankful, almost a, in a in an obsessive way. Whenever they get together, the council gets together, they thank everybody, all the elements, and they. All we're always so uh, forgiving and thankful for having been able to sit together and talk because they know it's a very fleeting world that the people are in. And the point uh, to make about that is that it's going to end. I mean, you can't, you can't preserve human life forever. And the tribes are always aware of that. But the, but the planet keeps living. Even if it's not as healthy of a place for human beings, it's going to keep spinning. And the water's going to keep running and the rain's going to keep falling and the snow's going to keep coming. And it doesn't mean something ended. I mean, we, we, we end, but what difference does that make? I mean, like we have to have a lot of invest invested in this world to have some status. And we don't have that yet. I don't think humans yet, but, but uh, maybe we never will. But uh, just the point is that the tribes are always looking for that last day, but they're very thankful for the one they have. But that means just because they leave, the world doesn't change. The world's always going to be what it always was before we came. So when we go, it'll still be going. And it's, it's fine. Without, without us, it's fine. You know? <laughs> I gave that talk at Princeton, and all the scientists said, the world didn't care about us at dinner. And I, they said, I said, no. And they said, oh, I don't know what to do about that. I, well, it, you got to do a lot more to be cared about than just sit in this room, you know, give a, give a speech and, and be a professor. You know, you have to actually put in some sweat equity into this into this planet the, the tibetans have this funny idea that um the physical body the flesh and bone body is one of three bodies but that the flesh and bone body is called the enjoyment body not for us to enjoy um, um within ourselves but to radiate enjoyment into mm -hmm. the world that's something very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Try that on. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> you can also try on, just for a few moments, not having a self-image. Yes. And experiment. How long can we sustain yes. not having a self-image during the day, during our activities, and see where that goes? What you said earlier, about not having the me, not having the I. I mean, that in, in an indigenous, and I'm, I'm a instructor in the earth renewal ceremony so i i've been doing this for 30 years in the, in the tribe but the, the point is it's about the collective obviously it's always the collective and if you're not in the collective you're making a big mistake uh, your whole life existence is like pretty much worthless if you don't have a collective that you're a member of who can actually disregard you because it's a collective it's, you're not that important even in the collective but you're in the wheel you're in the hoop and you don't have to be a big shot. You can sit down and be quiet, shut up, and just be in the, be in the hoop. And, and you're in the collective. And, and that's where you want to be, you know, your whole life. You want to you kind of offer that kind of fostering of the collective. You're the youth, the elders together. We want to always have that. That's where we belong. Penny. It's lovely, you know. I mean, just that simple cultural. Penny, Penny's trying to speak. It's 
It's beautiful. Oh, you are muted. Let's unmute you. How do we do that? Unmute. Penny, Penny you're muted. You need to unmute. unmute it. How do we unmute you? There you go. Okay. There you okay. go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Well, first, we what a pleasure. Hear. What a pleasure to be in such a distinguished company. I so appreciate it. I agree. Touch my heart. Um, but I wanted to say the role of the artist is to basically dig as deep as they can into themselves and beyond their ego, beyond that individual self. And my belief is if you go deep enough, then you come up with something which really can touch the heart of the collective. Because we all have yes. these dark nights of the soul. We all have these things if we're willing to be visceral enough and touch the depth as much as the heights and, you know, just key that transformative process into being, then our personal identity can be completely um, dedicated to what is the good of the all and that alchemy that can be performed by the individual on behalf of the whole collective and tribe. So I just realize that everyone here understands and recognizes that and I'm echoing it out for us all where the where the mystic and the artist rubber hits the road that's I think the point of <laughs> you solve yourself nicely said nicely said well um yes um some people are writing in I think we should open up to a few questions if you all can stay just a bit longer is that is that okay we're already a quarter over okay so, um, um, okay, you know, I'm a novice on this uh, Zoom. I'm, I'm pleased I've done as well as I have. But um, I wanted people to raise their, do the raise their hand button. We have a, a, a message here from Paris saying, very valuable with what is being said by Vera Dickman. Thank you. Um, uh, my takeaway is we indeed need art more than ever because we need transmutation and healing, hence alchemy, hence mystical understanding of energy more than ever. Thanks for this great invitation and exchange. Look forward to going through the exhibition. Awesome. Okay, so how do we do the... Um, got them. We want people to raise cool. their, hit cool. their raise cool. the hand yeah. button and then you yep. can, I can turn on your mic hey, and then you can actually speak. Yes, John. Morning, Brad. Um, if there are 30 participants, why are we not seeing the community here on the screen? Um, because this is a webinar. Um, so we did it a little different than what the Institute for Cultural okay. Activism has been doing. Yeah. No, yeah. You, yeah. So we we yeah. separated it. But um, so basically, um, if you would like to say something, um, you, you hit the raise your hand button and then I can open up your mic. Oh, and I, I, I might just, um, I'm just going to, uh, let's see, how do I do this? Um, ask to unmute, mute, allowed to talk. I'm just going to open up the mic of everybody. And if anybody would like to, um, would like to say something, then you're more than welcome. Um, yes, I would like to ask something. Can hi. I? Yes, who are I you? What's your name? My name is Babette. I'm from Amsterdam. Oh, hi. Hi, Babette. Hi, old friend of John. And yeah. um, a not student. Not, not too old, Babette. <laughs> well, long, long time, since 77, yeah. John. Um, anyway, I'm a student of Joseph Boyce, and I would like to ask a question to Edgar. Um, I've, it has always puzzled me uh, that there has been some controversy about the amazing, beautiful piece that Joseph Boyce did with the coyote in uh, New York. You know, he locked himself up with a live coyote eh, from an American reservation. And um, so from a Native American reservation, of course, because he believed in the uh, power of the coyote for the Native American Indians. And uh, so I'm intrigued why um, uh, several people have uh, mistaken that as an abuse because the man really uh, loved animals and the animal realm. So as we have already uh, heard from Monet and John, of course he was a shaman in terms of healing with art. 
he made German art respectable again after the war. And me, as a female student of his, I would never call him, uh, you know, a macho. But that is besides the point. <laughs> My uh, question is, his encounter with the, uh, with the life coyote has made some controversy. And I would like you to ask you if you understand why that was controversial. Well, I was found uh, that really very reassuring. I, I think that happens often in the USA where the USA doesn't really acknowledge or honor its, its own origins. You know, and, and that happens a lot. Like I, I worked a lot in Australia with Aboriginal artists. And, uh, and, and so, you know, we had a lot of, uh, you know, respect for the Aboriginal community. And then some of Australia joined in with that, you know, and, and, and put designs of their, of their art on the airplanes, you know, when you flew into Australia. Um, yeah. But in America, you know, natives are pretty invisible, even within <laughs> USA. But 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 that that boy saw the indigenous animal as being more important to contact than the American, which I which I believe in. I too I believe in that too. I'd rather be with the buffalo than be at the shopping mall. You know, so so I'd rather be with our buffalo herd. You know, and see the see the small young buffalo and be there with my daughter. And so I I think he was he was he was dead on. You know, to to encounter the indigenous spirit of the animal and and disregard you know Soho or Chelsea or. New York City, you know, and really, and really inter interface with the actual animal, and I think that's what we need to do more of, you know, which, which America really does fails to see, uh, in terms of indigenous culture, too. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you all of you. Uh, you know, I must echo what was said before that it's really a pleasure to uh, listen in to you and to be so inspired by. All of you, thank you so much. I'm happy. And uh, so just just I, for the um, just for the for the record, and but Bet, thank you for um, you know trying to help me articulate this a little bit. I didn't mean that Joseph was sexist, but that he was a sort of patriarch, which I think was very normal in his in his time and culture. Um, not to say that Joseph didn't empower women and men to be themselves and to really work hard for society and to work hard together. And I um, want to acknowledge Babette's work, by the way, as um, Babette created a television channel in Holland uh, for the topic of Buddhism. And um, I think Joseph would have considered this an extraordinary social sculpture. Uh, among Babette's work, that's just one one of her facets. She's a, an amazing artist, filmmaker, and and uh, producer. Wonderful. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Um, we have Thank Kitty you. Kitty Diggins who raised her hand. Hello, oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, all the artists that you have in in this collective are so incredibly fantastic and some I've followed for years, especially Penny, um, you know, more than 35 years. Um, I've been very aware of her work. I think that something that um, comes up for me and probably a lot of people um, is we're in this sort of context right now where um, there are so many different divisions regarding culture and gender politics. How do you, how do you participate? How do you do it correctly? And well, I think we're in a healing crisis. I call it a post-colonial healing crisis. Although many yes. and say that colonialism never stopped. So it's it, exactly. Yeah. But it, but it is a healing crisis. And so I think you just have to stay open and compassionate to yeah. hearing and listening there are all these different brands of feminism now and different brands of how to do racial conversations and so forth well i think you can't really um afford to think how other people are going to see you i think you've really got to to your own self be true 
And I like the idea of living your whole life as a work of art. That if one did that, and the, the tantric dictum of uh, really weaving together a spiritual and material life so that everything that you do and you are is part of your sadhana, part of your spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And then we can start to look beneath the skin and see that body of light that John was referring to that's in everybody and everything. And if we start using those as the things we measure our existence and our actions and our thought forms, everything by, then we can start to heal this huge division and not be worrying about how we're seen and whether we're politically correct, but actually setting the new standards ourselves by living them and being them and choosing to do that. And you have to be kind of brave to do that. It is a little bit of a warrior path sometimes, but I really think it's the only choice to make at this time to find that integrity inside and to take those things that are spiritual truths to be able to measure yourself by and meditate on until you become more and more divinized. So you bring more and more of the divine into yourself and into your actions on a daily level. And then that influences out from you to other people and that right. helps everyone. Yeah. Um, we're going to take another question. Mm -hmm. I believe Lady Monster had a question. Is that true? Oh, they can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Lady Monster is in our exhibition. She is one of the exhibiting artists. Hello, Lady Monster. Hello. <laughs> um, so with the, uh, it, my being part of this art show is extraordinary and um, uh, very serendipitous. Uh, I was on this uh, personal journey and then all of a sudden I get this uh, message from Monet and I was like, oh, that's so funny. That's exactly what I was just going to do for myself. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, and now this conversation that you have all had this afternoon, it just expounds more on this inner journey of mine and the mysticism, the spirituality, the magic, the witchery, like the divination and all of it connecting and the silence and the stillness and the art and bringing forth who I am as an artist, as a performer, as a member of community and, um, and this, and the COVID and the stay in place and, everything it's just like it's a culmination and i just had to say something and be so full of gratitude to be in this space with all of you and how uh phenomenal i'm feeling right now and appreciative oh my best <laughs> and actually well, penny was talking about oh i don't mean to cut you off sorry no, go ahead no please well penny said something about living living the, your life as an artwork and i don't know if she's interested in saying something but we have uh, Munda montano aka mother Teresa. thank you yes i don't know Linda, if you can hear and if you want to say something no pressure but i would pressure I, pressure we want to hear from you pressure can you unmute, you, can you unmute um, your mic miss linda maybe she's is she here um, maybe she's pressure. here pressure pressure, pressure. Ah, she's unmiked. Linda? I'm really sorry. Today I'm Bob Dylan. I Today you're Bob Dylan? Excuse me. Okay, we'll, we have Bob Dylan with us today. I can't talk. You can't talk? I'm Bob Dylan. Okay. And I, but I love Mother Teresa. I think she's a, a wonderful person. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful person. <laughs> she would, she went, she went where she needed to go, and she did what she needed to do. And Bob loves her so much. Bob, Bob loves her a lot. Thank you very much. I have to go now. Thank you. I have to go okay. To the studio. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. <Bob. laughs> All right. And Linda has a beautiful piece in the show if you haven't seen it. <laughs> Uh, she's singing it. Linda seamlessly scene. blends the political and the mystical, like the true master that she is, 
she, I called her and she said, I'm just feeling really apolitical right now and didn't seem interested at all in making a work. And then the next day she sent me one in the, in my, in my G drive and said, I made a work. I got really inspired. And it made me cry. It literally brought tears. And I was so honored to be receiving this piece from her. And it is the last work in the show in Gallery 3. It's the final. It ends with Linda. Do you need to leave, Edgar? I wanted to add that I met Linda in Houston. Oh. She she was red. She was all in red and listening to a certain (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> back in, back in the 80s I think probably in the 80s or something yeah yeah all right what was she doing in red yeah she was good she was doing very well very <laughs> she was probably in the chakra that corresponds to red yeah. survival yeah. survival trauma um we have william poi lee are you are you with us william yeah i am hi um, hi uh, I don't know if you see me. I'm actually down in Mexico right now, and uh, on the Lucky beach, you. 85 degree, and so I'm kind of not wearing any clothes. But oh wow, that, that doesn't mean anything to this group. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I've um, thoroughly enjoyed the show. Um, I unfortunately, because of the time difference, and I was working on a project, I kind of missed the art part. And I hope I can just uh, go back into. It. I did see uh, Eggers' uh, piece. Um, well, this is great. It kind of reminds me of who I am. Oh, you know, good. you get busy, you do stuff, you know, you have these uh, tendencies and abilities. Occasionally they come over and that's your life. Then other times you're back in the mix with something else. So as you know, Monet, I'm, I'm kind of in an in-between space and, um, um, I, you know, I need to change and I know the world needs to change. And I'm not sure how it's going to be or whether we should worry too much about it or probably change anyway but hopefully for the better. So yeah, it's good to hear this. This inspires me and gets me uh, thinking and meditating. So thank you all. Thank William, you, William. W- William, what, what are we going to do next? Uh, I'm going to go swimming, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to swim for peace and uh, raising consciousness. <laughs> you sound like a water activist, William. <laughs> you know, I've always loved water. Um, for some strange reason, the rest of the world collapsed. The folks here can probably make it because we even apparently have wells, you know, in the earth that they don't even use, but the water is there. So I don't know how I got here. Um, it was, I think, by intuition. I needed rejuvenation, and I'm, I'll be 70 in a couple of months, and this place is rejuvenating me. And in fact, that's the name of my house, Casa Rejuvenature. Ah. So I'm kind of involved. That's very feminine. Yeah, That's the it? feminine oh, principle, wow. William. Oh, <laughs> but um, once this place is fixed, you and Brad are welcome to come down. Anytime. All right. So, anyway, yeah, going to Mexico. I don't really have a lot more to say, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to wrap up. And um, I'm um, very pleased with how this went. Everybody had such a wonderful piece of the conversation. It was a G. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for not only taking a, a leap of faith and doing this show with me, but also coming on and speaking today. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, everybody watching, the show is called Invocation Democracy. It is a virtual exhibition, so you can access it anywhere in the world. It is presented in 3D galleries by Pro Arts Commons in Oakland. Um, I will write in the uh, messaging chat here, but if you just go to Pro Arts Commons, you will find uh, we're on the landing page, uh, or you go proartscommons.org forward slash invocation democracy. The show is up through January 20th, 2021, holding vigil for a peaceful transition of power and the democracy we envision. It is in itself a mystical spell um, holding the space for um, the restoration of our democracy and the repair of our democracy. Okay, so thank you all so much. Thank you, Bye. Bye. I missed you. I missed you already. <laughs> thank you.
Lucky us. <laughs>